Good afternoon, everybody. Bienvenue à tous. My name is David Eidelman. I'm uh, uh, Vice Principal Health Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to a session on healthcare in deep space, autonomous medicine, practical AI, and advanced simulation. This is uh, this session's part of McGill Space Week, as you know, and it's a signature event of McGill's bicentennial uh, celebrations. You know, we, t we just heard about AI, we heard about uh, uh, the uh, application of existing technologies, and we heard about complexity. And space missions obviously are the prototype of highly complex uh, systems operating in an environment in which you have to handle lots of heterogeneous data uh, and information sets. And, and in order to be successful in spaceflight, uh, you have to figure out how to do this. And to do that, you need to really uh, know what you're talking about. And there, and now, Professor Smith's going to describe the foundational principles necessary to integrate all aspects of uh, complex systems, including emission systems, using biologic and other data, and uh, into an information architecture that really supports the use of advanced modular algorithms. And so, uh, Professor Smith, uh, the floor is yours. Um, I'm going to transfer over. Um, take it away. Good. So um, I, I'm not going to be able to do all of that, but I will try and do at least some samples, which will give you an idea of how it could be done. And uh, I'll start with uh, some background. So I started life as a philosopher working on metaphysics. Uh, recently, I started a whole new uh, line of thinking. Uh, I'm about to publish a book with a German AI entrepreneur colleague of mine on uh, artificial intelligence, which more or less um, agrees with everything that Gary Marcus says in his book, but takes it further. So we try and document in great detail the limits of AI when dealing specifically with complex systems such as organisms and missions to Mars and so forth. And if we've got time, I may come back to uh, show the relevance of that to the main topic here, so which goes back to 2002 when I um, uh, was awarded a prize to establish an institute in Germany to deal with the ontology of medicine. And uh, this, this uh, prize was awarded because people working in uh, computational ontology already then had started to use some of my ideas from philosophical ontology. So I started the institute and the first thing I realized was that I was probably going to be spending the rest of my life studying one single ontology, which was the gene ontology, which John mentioned already. Gene ontology solved a very considerable problem, namely the problem of making human genome and mouse genome and fly genome data useful for medicine. And the idea was that the gene ontology provided a systematic, semantically well-grounded, common consensus terminology across all organisms and all disciplines, which could be used to tag sequences, whether they're gene sequences or protein sequences or any other kind of sequence. And uh, this was gr a, a great success. Um, it was brought to my attention very early on in working in this new institute. And the first thing I realized about it was that it was full of mistakes and uh, mistakes of a logical nature, which a philosopher learns about in the first logic class at the beginning of their studies. And so I had money for the new institute. I invited the leadership of the gene ontology to come to the institute in Leipzig. and. Um, I went through pointing out all the mistakes that they were making. So this is just one example. A lytic vacuole within a protein storage vacu vacuole is classified by the gene ontology as a protein storage vacuole. It was then. This is a bit like saying that an embryo within a uterus is a uterus. It's a, an ontological mistake of a very simple logical sort. And in those days, the gene ontology was full of such mistakes. Uh, it was also doing the job of providing semantic definitions useful to humans in a, in a way which involved similar kinds of mistakes. So 
this is a circular definition. Um, it's not a good definition. It doesn't, it doesn't and it cannot tell you anything about the meaning of hemolysis because the word is used in the definition. So I presented a talk at the meeting uh, in Leipzig entitled Stop or Smart Terminology Through Ontological Principles. And the, uh, the head of the Gene Ontology Initiative, Michael Ashburner, at the end of, who was in the room uh, on the front row smiling throughout, he took me behind the curtain and he made a deal with me. He said, Barry, I will put you in charge of the logic of the gene ontology and in return you will promise never to criticize the gene ontology in public. And I, I sold my soul, I said yes, um, I'm not criticizing the gene ontology today. Um, the gene ontology has improved in part, I think, because of some of the things I did. But more importantly, I helped the gene ontology to marshal or he heard the many cats, that is to say the many other ontologies, which were being built in biomedicine in its wake, ontologies in areas like proteomics or anatomy or disease. And some of the ontologies mentioned by John earlier today were built precisely in this effervescence of ontology creativity in medicine, or in, let's say in biology, to be careful, which uh, arose as a result of the success of the gene ontology. So the OBO Foundry is a collection of ontologies which are built to be interoperable from the very start. So this is anticipating silos and deliberately taking steps, establishing principles to avoid the, the, the appearance of those silos by ensuring that everybody involved in the ontology building effort is aware of what everyone else who is involved in the ontology building effort at the points where the ontologies overlap so that the overlap is always such that the ontologies which do overlap are consistent in those areas. So this is a picture of the of the Obo foundry as it then was. Basic formal ontology is the very top level of the gene ontology. It's a reverse engineered generalization of the gene ontology, which covers everything in the universe, but only at a very general metaphysical level. And we'll see a bit more about what that means later on. So basic formal ontology is the key to the unifiability of all the ontologies which are built in a way that descends from basic formal ontology. It provides the starting point for defining the terms in non-circular ways in principle in every other ontology. We've got now to 2005. Now this, uh, this is a hub and spokes model of ontology development. You start with a top level and then you move to a slightly more specific level and then you move from there to a slightly more specific level, all the while maintaining maximal consistency in areas where ontologies overlap. And this worked, it worked really well, and the army heard about it. And in 2008, I was um, presenting a talk uh, which was designed to help the army solve problems that they had with silos in their data from Afghanistan at the time. And it was the army eventually which sponsored the proposal to make BFO an international standard, ISO IEC 21838-2. I'll come back to that. Well, it's here, actually. There are two parts. The first part standardizes what it means to be a top-level ontology. So an ontology that can serve as a universal general hub for the spokes which are created by domain ontologies. And then part two shows that BFO is satisfying the requirements for being a top level ontology set forth in part one. And these standards are both in the public domain, you don't have to pay for them. And BFO, of course, is also in the public domain. Uh, it's used now by some 500 different initiatives and the number grows all the time. So in 2010, my colleagues in Buffalo received a, a very large IARPA grant to create a set of ontologies to deal with everything in the universe. These are called the common core ontologies. They, they were built to satisfy some needs of the intelligence community, which are not important here. But what is important is that some of the ontologies within that ecosystem 
were created for space. And this is just a few examples. So this is the Common Core Ontologies ecosystem. The space ontologies are down here. So we have space event ontology, space object ontology, a space mission ontology, and so forth. And we deal with things like resident space objects, such as satellites, missions, functions, components, and so forth. These are the space objects. And then we have object aggregates. Uh, we have orbits. And so this is the ontology of different kinds of orbits. Uh, you thought the idea of orbit was simple, and it is not simple. And then we have missions and maneuvers. Uh, we have sensors. And, uh, and now we get back to medicine. So uh, John made a number of points uh, concerning what we would need to address if we wanted to have useful medicine ontology. And it's rather easy, to, it's probably too easy to build ontologies. The problem is to build useful ontologies. And useful ontologies should be interoperable with existing useful ontologies. And so there is a certain homesteading effect in the world of ontology. If you have ontologies which are already serving a purpose and doing it very well, then you should, if you want to build an ontology in a related domain, you should ensure that you build your ontology by using what exists already as your starting point. This very often doesn't happen because you, you get paid for doing something new and for reusing what already exists, it's hard to get paid. And so there is a, a certain uh, tendency to promote silo formation of the sort which John described. So how do we build a useful space medicine ontology? That was, in fact, part of what we were trying to do from the very beginning in the medical information science. Although, of course, we had no idea that this would become particularly relevant in the, in the space context. So what we want to do is to document medical knowledge, especially as it's relevant to space travel. And then we want to find an optimal way in which relevant knowledge can be retrieved on a mission. And the idea would be that you have all the medical knowledge that there is, and you have some way of finding the medical knowledge that you need that can, can find that knowledge very quickly and very successfully. And the problem is, that all the medical knowledge that you have is full of garbage. And this is one of the reasons why foundation models, as described by Gary, are so unhelpful when it comes to mission critical applications. So why is the totality of medical knowledge that we have full of garbage? Well, first of all, doctors make mistakes and medical science advances. Doctors don't always keep pace with medical advances. Some of them do, some of them don't. And so doctors have conflicts. They have inconsistent diagnoses, sometimes for the same patient. And all of this gets added to the totality of medical knowledge. All of the EMRs which exist and all of the problem lists which exist grow and get bigger and bigger and get added to the totality of medical knowledge. Old records are still records. When doctors make diagnoses, clinical coders have to document those diagnoses using clinical codes. And those clinical coders make errors in coding and they have certain tendencies and habits to code in certain ways and different coders have different habits. And then worst of all, and that's what I'm going to talk about next, is that the coding systems change. And this is good because medical science advances, but the coding systems should change gracefully and they should change in such a way that changes then can be fed back to filter out the consequences of the older systems which have been shown to be no longer scientifically coherent. And even worse then, coding systems themselves ferment errors because some of the coding systems are, to be honest, badly built. And, uh, and then coding systems generate forking. This is a, a problem that we will see in a minute. All right, now I could say bad things about most medical coding systems, I'm afraid. I had a, uh, a long career in which I was comparable to the little boy who says that the emperor does not have any clothes, where the emperor were, was world leading uh, medical coding systems communities. It was a, an exciting time. 
This is a quote from Gary. So foundation models, he says, are more like parlor tricks than genuine intelligence. In, unfortunately, the, the problems in medicine don't even yield the parlor tricks. They're not interesting errors. They're just errors of a very messy sort. Now let's look at SNOMED CT, which John already mentioned, and he mentioned Roger Cote. I will uh, mention a story about Roger Cote, which I'm not sure is true, but th certainly there's some truth to it. Cote visited the Vatican. He wanted to present the six volumes of SNOMED CT to the Pope. And so he was chatting with the Pope and the Pope was looking at the six volumes and then the Pope, Pope raised his head and he said, are you aware that this spells demons backwards? Now, whether that is a true story or not, uh, no one will ever know. So this is a little piece of SNOMED showing how it changed from 2016 to 2017. It's a very, very trivial example, but it will show you how you get bloat. So this is the opposite of silos. Bloat is when you get inconsistent data because there isn't a silo. In 2016, a test kit is classified as a substance, which may or may not be good. In 2017, it's classified as a physical object, which also may or may not be good. But the fact that you have both of those classifications in your system is going to mean that data about test kit, which was entered into the record in 2016, will conflict with data about test kits entered in 2017. And that's not good if it happens all the time. Now, here we have 2015, 2016. We see that there is on the left a joint finding and disorder of musculoskeletal system. These are both parents of arthropathy, which is a disorder. Now, a disorder is something on the side of the patient. It's a broken leg or it's a disease. A finding is something on the side of a physician. It's what the physician finds or discovers in the world. One of the same things should not be both on the side of the patient and on the side of the clinician. It's a very basic error. SNOMED is full of that error. There are so many different ways in which that error is made in SNOMED that SNOMED generates bloat. And now this is just one term in SNOMED and two versions, 2002 and 2010. So the term is excision biopsy of vulval lesion. This term is chosen at random. You would get similar bloats from many terms. So every single track through this monster can be found if you join SNOMED 2002 with 2010. And the clinical coders are coding at different levels within this monster. They're putting down data about one and the same medical phenomenon, namely uh, the process of biopsy from a vulval lesion. And they're each coding that with a different code. So how it looks is this. So this is just this is from that diagram. I've just zoomed a little bit. Procedure characterized by action status is a navigational concept in SNOMED. That means it tells you how you got that concept or something. And then you have procedure carried out on subject, which is what SNOMED calls a situation. We're also told that it's a procedure carried out, which is another situation. But at the same time, it's a procedure on a body system, which is a procedure. So we have four ontologically different things, namely navigational concepts, situations, and procedures applied to one and the same medical phenomenon. And the reason is that SNOMED's top level is incoherent. Now, its incoherence has been recognized uh, for some years by what we might call the intellectual leaders of the SNOMED community. And each year, they propose to the general SNOMED management assembly that they should drop the SNOMED top level and re-architect SNOMED using BFO. There is now reason to be optimistic that they will finally achieve a majority vote. BFO does not allow that kind of forking. It doesn't allow four different terms at the very high ontological level to be applied to one and the same item. It's built on good ontological principles. And it's much simpler to use than, than the SNOMED top level. And it makes clear distinctions between things like 
entities on the side of the patient and entities on the side of the clinician. So how do we get a useful space medicine ontology? Well, NASA has a chief information officer and they have a, an information system, which is an information system covering all of the astronauts who ever existed in, in the West and all the families of all the astronauts. It's very high level. It uses, unfortunately, multiple coding systems, but all of the coding systems could, in principle, be unified and focused on a revised version of SNOMED, which is what the, the NASA CIO should be calling for, a revised version with a proper top level. It should eliminate the errors, basically, where they are easily identifiable. And it's here, I think, that AI could play a role because we already have a large amount of data which is relevant to space missions because the astronauts are involved. It's maintained and curated by top level clinicians and it's accessible already. It just needs to be filtered to remove inconsistencies. And um, well, I just conclude. So. This would therefore be useful for space medicine. As John explained, it would be useful for everyone else because it would serve as a kind of ground truth, uh, the equivalent of a foundation model, but one which would have been well built. And uh, I won't try and talk uh, about deep mind. I will, uh, I will stop and uh, hope you're all still there.